five, four, three, two, one. We have liftoff of Norfolk Grumman's 18th Commercial Resupply Services mission. The SS Sally Ride has begun its journey to the International Space Station. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome everyone to our stream. Now, if you've been keeping tabs on all things space, you know that a Northrop Grumman Antares rocket launched from Wallace Flight Facility destined for the International Space Station National Lab. What you might not know is that not one, not two, not three, but seven of those projects were supported by the National Science Foundation. So as you might imagine, it's a pretty exciting day for us around here. Hey everyone, my name is Adam Eggers and I'm coming to you from the NSF Video Lab. Well, it's, it's not actually a lab, it's just our video studio, but with YouTube handles coming out, our handle is actually gonna be at NSF Video Lab. It's more creative and it sounded a little bit more sciencey. So today we'll have something pretty cool for you guys. We'll be chatting with a few of the researchers whose work is on board and on its way to the microgravity world of space. We'll hear about their projects, we'll ask them some questions, and find out how their work may end up benefiting us here down on Earth. We'll also be releasing several videos this week talking more about the individual research projects going up. So definitely look out for those. And of course, the easiest way to know when those come out is to subscribe. So please consider subscribing and hit that notification bell to know when new science and technology research stories come out. Okay, jumping in, my first question is for you guys. So let's imagine that you get the phone call and you're allowed to go up to the International Space Station and they'll allow you to choose how long you wanna stay. Would you stay for one week, one month, or six months? Uh, I know for me personally, let's see. So if I'm gonna go for a week, that doesn't seem like I'm taking advantage of the once in a lifetime opportunity, uh, but six months for anything is a really long time. So I think for me, I would choose one month. I think you get enough of the experience that it, it makes it worth it. The food's gonna be weird up there. I think I saw a video once where they sleep upright, like belted in up against a wall, and, and I don't think I can, I can do that. It's also a pretty small, pretty small space up there. Uh, so I don't think I could do six months, but I think I think one month is good enough. How long do you guys think? Put those uh, comments down in the chat, and we'll see how long you guys want to go up there. Um, so let's go ahead and get one of our researchers on air. Let's start with Alan Liu from the University of Michigan. Welcome. Uh, I think I'm kind of generally curious. How did you become interested in biomechanics and biomedical engineering? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've always been fascinated by how organisms uh, sensitive respond to forces. Um, so as a kid, I spent a lot of time outdoor observing, you know, insects and little organisms. Uh, and every single organism is mechanical sensitive. So uh, if you wanted to figure out something is dead or alive, you actually mechanically probe it. So this is a natural instinct that uh, humans have. And uh, so I've always interested in that. Uh, as I grow up, I um, uh, became more fascinated in the microscopic world. So I'm always keen on learning how cells actually in our body functions and how they will sense different stimulus. Uh, so my scientific uh, interests naturally emerge over time to look at how mechanical forces impact cell functions and how cells communicate with one another. So that's an uh, area in biomedical engineering. Now, moving towards your research project for the International Space Station, which deals with osteoporosis, it leads me to ask you a question. What is an osteoblast? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's fun to think about a different cell type in the body, um, and this is something interesting that the, our body consists of roughly 200 cell types and there are about 35 trillion cells. So osteoblast is a type of cell uh, and one of the four major cell types in bone. And its primary function is to make bone. And there's another cell type called osteoplast that is to resorb bone, which is to uh, essentially, uh, you know, um, uh, taking bone away. So these two cells, you know, will keep the balance of the bone. One generates bone, the other one takes away bone. Um, so it's a very important cell type in our body. Okay, makes sense. The body giveth and the body taketh away. So with your study, what could you learn about osteoporosis that we didn't know before? Yeah, so, um, yeah, as you, you know, people may know, osteoporosis uh, causes bone to become weak and brittle. Um, and, you know, as people age, this... Uh, uh, the symptoms will actually lead to fracture if uh, someone falls, you know, uh, due to mild stress. 
Um, and we do know that there is uh, dietary habits or hormone levels and certain medical conditions that will lead to osteoporosis. Uh, but also know that um, weight bearing exercise can actually be beneficial to the bones uh, that lower the risk of osteoporosis. Um, and our study uh, is looking at how microgravity um, you know, could actually expedite a symptom like osteoporosis. So it's a condition for us to sort of simulate this medical condition uh, that it's hard to, you know, sort of um, replicate uh, on earth unless you're aging. So in some way, we're, um, I think this is the first time that we can actually look at uh, osteoblast uh, mechanical properties, uh, as well as their function under microgravity. So, uh, and, and because we'll be looking at gene expression profiles, um, we're sending the cells into ISS and looking at how they respond to mechanical loading as well as biochemical uh, stimulation that this study will actually help, uh, hopefully help us understand osteoporosis a little bit more. Um, yeah, and provide some information there. Okay, yeah, that could that could be a big deal. I was reading an article the other day um, and it estimated something like 10 million people in the U.S. have osteoporosis and upwards of like 44 million people have low bone density, uh, which is which is a crazy number. So I guess the the other kind of big question I had was, so how is your experiment actually going to be conducted up there? Is like, is an astronaut running it, or is it just sitting in a box in the back? Like, how is that working? This is the most fascinating part. So we have paired up with a, a company that essentially help us translate our ground experiment to space. And this is not going to be done by a human, uh, but it will be controlled uh, by, you know, by, by, by us on the ground. Um, so everything will be automated. Um, and the experiment itself is, 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 isn't, like you said, in the, is in the box. Um, but we get a control of uh, uh, the experiment from Earth and also be collecting data on Earth. Yeah. Wait, that's crazy. You're going to have real-time access? Yeah, there, there is. So we haven't actually gone through that training yet, but uh, my understanding is that uh, we will be given the portal and we'll be able to view the sensor data uh, on Earth. Um, um, I'm guessing there will be some delay, but it will be real-time enough that we can actually make decisions on Earth as to how to proceed. And because uh, and, some of our data, you know, experiment involve uh, pressurizing the system, so we'll actually be able to watch you know, is the system being, you know, pressurized and we'll also be taking images uh, live, you know, while the, the samples are on the International Space Station. So those are likely more real time. Yeah. Now, reading further through your research, uh, I saw something called a random positioning machine. How does how does that work? Sure, sure. Yeah. So the, the random position machine or we call RPM. Uh, essentially is a device that helps simulate microgravity. And my lab actually uh, built one uh, a year, a, a couple of years ago, and to essentially try to bridge, you know, uh, the things that we do on Earth so that we can do some preliminary experiments uh, instead of having to send things to the ISS to carry out the real microgravity experiments. Um, and the way it works is by rotating two frames uh, independently um, so we can think about microgravity is basically you don't sense uh, gravity. One easy way to do that is um, imagine you're in an elevator. If the cable breaks, uh, you will feel weightless, right? Um, because you and the elevator will fall uh, downward at the same rate. Um, now, there are other ways to assimilate microgravity. Um, uh, in this way, we're rotating a sample uh, independently from, you know, in two different axes. And this is uh, sort of a... Uh, the, the effect is based on um, averaging gravity vectors. So gravity is always pointing downwards, right? But if you rotate a sample, even though gravity is always uh, pointing downwards, you're, you're, you're changing the positions of the, the, you know, the experimental sample. Uh, and by doing this in two different orientations, you can essentially time average uh, the gravity vectors. So the sample basically feels uh, little to no gravity. Uh, and that's the basis of how it works. And what kind of results have you seen with that so far? Yeah, so we um, one of our experiment on the ISS the sort of tying this back to the osteoblast um, is we're trying to uh, determine the mechanical properties of osteoblast uh, under microgravity conditions. So, um, and we have a, a, a microfooted device, something that my lab created about eight years ago that basically measured the mechanical property of single cells. And by mechanical property, I mean the stiffness. Right, so uh, we can associate stiffness as how hard or how soft a material is, and we can actually measure that mechanical property of a cell. 
So what we did is we subject our the osseoblast and the simulating microgravity condition using the, the RPM, the random position machine. Uh, and then we measured the properties of those cells. And we found that uh, these cells became a little bit softer uh, after we subject six hours of microgravity. So um, and the hypothesis there is that as the osteoblasts experience microgravity, they become softer. And this is the reason why uh, it could potentially develop into osteoporosis if they're in the bones, um, because their activities are tied to this mechanical uh, stiffness. So what's the... What's the end result? What's the what's the goal, or what are you hoping to find out with this experiment on the ISS? Yeah, so we're um, you know as I sort of alluded to, the hypothesis is that the cells become softer under microgravity, and the second component of the study is to look at if we can mechanically stimulate the cells by applying compressive stress, would that revert the effect of microgravity? So um, just like how we you know don't sense microgravity when the uh, when the condition changes, um, the question is, can we um, essentially provide almost like, you know, uh, provide a condition such that the cells feel that they are under micro, uh, gravity uh, condition, and this may um, essentially slow down, you know, say osteoporosis or things that happen in space where, you know, people, um, you know, astronauts lose uh, bone mass, maybe we can revert that. Okay, so you, you've done all this work, you have a project, it's going up into space. So what is the most exciting aspect of you having this research project go up to the ISS? Uh, um, there are a couple of things. So, I, I, well, first of all, I do have the knowledge the project is um, uh, does come with a lot of frustrations and challenges. And, and I think that part in part is due to um, the translation of ground experiment to uh, to space is not easy. And, and this is something I learn as I go on. So we're in year three of the project now, um, and, and and there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in the process itself. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like the experience that of, of planning an experiment like this itself is very, very unique, and um, and very few people get to experience that. So I kind of uh, feel this is a reward itself that I can describe this to my colleagues, uh, to my family and friends who, you know, perhaps don't know exactly what I do. <laughs> um, they, they can understand sort of the, the impact that this type of uh, study could make. Um, to me personally, the most exciting part of this research is um, is, is is seeing this cellular level research happening on the ISS. And you know, ISS has been around for a while. I think um, the capabilities are constantly uh, improving, and and the studies that we're doing and others are doing are becoming more and more uh, feasible. And I think that to me is very exciting because I'm part of this movement of doing more cellular research on on the ISS and certainly in space. And, um, and as humans continue to explore space, um, this type of research is going to be really important in setting that, you know, um, path, I guess, you know, so we can learn more about doing biological research in space. Now, I asked our audience before you were on how long they would choose to stay on the ISS if given the chance. So for you, if they let you go up and perform your experiment hands on, would you do it? Absolutely. No doubt in my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking like, you know, people who want to fly to outer space, they have to pay a billion dollars. I'm not paying that. If I get a free ticket, I'm going. <laughs> well, obviously, good luck on your experiment. Very cool stuff that could help, you know, prevent osteoporosis as we all get older. But as you mentioned, loss of bone density is an issue for astronauts, too. So if we're going to start, you know, vacationing on Mars or whatever, we'll need to get that figured out. The next researcher we'll be chatting with is from UC Santa Barbara, lovely town, great seafood restaurants. Uh, welcome, Yang Ying Zhu. Uh, probably butchered that, and I apologize. Uh, first question I had is, how did you even become interested in thermal fluid engineering? Yeah, so when I was uh, maybe undergraduate student uh, in general mechanical engineering, um, I wanted to work on something that's related to energy and water. And so being thermal, which is, you know, related to energy and fluid, which is definitely related to like water, right? So uh, kind of becomes natural. And later when I kind of actually learned about this subject, I realized that how important it is for many applications, including 
you know, how we generate energy using a power plant and how we do desalination. So um, I think the more I learn about it, the more applications I, I found that I can apply this to. Now, after reading through your research or trying to read through your research, and I apologize, but I do need kind of a general a general description of what a surfactant is. Yeah, 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 sure. So uh, a surfactant is a molecule, basically, and these are kind of very special molecules. And when you add them to a fluid, fluid um, systems, uh, for example, like a wa water oil system, these surfactant, they actually, they like to stay at the fluid fluid interface. And so, and that is very beneficial for us because we can, we can tune the surfactant and to be able to manipulate droplets and bubbles uh, just because uh, they like to stay at the interface. I also read on the abstract for your NSF grant, and it talked about the boiling heat transfer and the role of bubbles and electricity, uh, which is baffling uh, to me. I'm trying to understand the role of bubbles and electricity. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, when, when people when we think about boiling, right, we, we all cook at home, and so it just becomes a really like everyday process. But uh, boiling is actually very important for. Uh, electricity generation. So in the US, um, you know, even if you use like um, nuclear energy, um, the majority of electricity is still produced by, you know, these steam cycles or these thermal kind of thermal engines. When uh, you actually have to, you use energy sources in terms of heat and you boil water and to produce very high pressure, high temperature vapor and then use these vapor to drive a turbine to produce work. And so the um, boiling actually and condensation uh, will be extremely important in determining the efficiency of how, uh, how many electricity, how much electricity we're generating. And so um, being able to improve the boiling uh, heat transfer uh, efficiency and, and, and also condensation, which is the reverse uh, turning vapor to liquid process. Uh, is is extremely important. Uh, it can help us uh, produce more electricity, uh, and uh, also, uh, like I said, in other applications, for example, uh, refrigeration, and this also uses a boiling process. So, why would you? Why would removing bubbles from a work surface be beneficial? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, because in a lot of these um, uh, applications I talk about, including boiling and condensation, these are actually what's called a phase change process. So for example, boiling is we're changing liquid to vapor and for condensation, we're changing uh, vapor to liquid. And so for these processes, we want continuous phase change. We don't want to just generate one bubble, two bubbles. We want the process to continue. So we want to be able to generate a bubble and then let the bubble depart from the surface such that we can use the surface to generate more bubbles. And uh, this can allow us to continuously, for example, generate electricity or continuously do uh, desalination. Uh, in other applications, there's not phase change, right? Uh, I think many people nowadays know how, like, you know, how important it is to generate hydrogen uh, fuels, and it's very similar process. So you, you generate hydrogen bubbles on an electrode surface, and you want that reaction to be continuously going on. So you want the hydrogen bubble to be removed such that you can collect them, and then the electrode surface can be used to generate new bubbles. And so, um, and these processes are important both on Earth and in space, and actually really diffi difficult to do on space because there's no buoyancy. So now we're talking about different light impacts. Can you explain how light comes into play at all here? Of course, yeah. So if we think about, you know, boiling, right? If we turn on our light, of, of course, nothing will change. Um, but what's unique about our experience uh, experiment is that we actually add a pinch of surfactant into this liquid. And so the surfactant will actually, they will absorb onto the bubble surfaces or droplet surfaces. And these surfactants are very special. They actually respond to light. So if you shine light on the surfactant 
and their the atom will rearrange their kind of structure. So they, the, the molecule will change their molecular conformation. And so as a result, in you, uh, the surfactant will generate a fluid flow around that interface of bubbles. And that fluid flow can generate a net force acting on the bubble and droplets. So that's the mechanism uh, of, uh, you know, the same is very similar system, but we just add some surfactant and we shine land on the surfactant, they will generate forces on bubbles. And so kind of to mimic like a gravity force or a buoyancy force that's absent in, in space. So that's what we are trying to test. So these lights are really important. Yes, which is for us to like turn on and turn off. And what could be the impact for us here on Earth based on your findings, uh, based on what your findings are? Yeah, great question. So we think uh, we can uh, learn two things. So first of all, right, we, for a fundamental understanding, we want to be able to know uh, what are the forces, right? What is the magnitude of the force that can be generated by these surfactants? And, um, and because there is no general theory or model uh, determining uh, these processes. So, and it's very critical for us uh, that we have an experiment where there is only this surfactant force existing. And it's very difficult to do on earth because there's, first of all, there is buoyancy, there is gravity. So these are coupled with the surfactant force. Um, and also if you heat, if you do boiling, um, there's also uh, convection, which is fluid flow due to density gradient. And that will be present on earth and that will be absent in space. So the space environment really provide us a really clean system where um, the only force that's existing is the force caused by the surfactant. So that will be a really nice environment for us to really understand this, um, this process. And second, I think uh, if we are able to demonstrate and achieve a manipulation, a precise manipulation of bubbles and droplets uh, using these lights, and we can benefit both space applications as well as Earth applications. And for example, we can potentially enhance the heat transfer performance of boiling uh, both in, in on Earth and also on, in space, uh, but um, also ex this can be extended to you know water harvesting um, and even like catalysis to generate hydrogens. And so there are for application point of view and both fundamental understanding point of view. I think we can learn a lot from this experiment. So that could mean like enhanced battery systems for space travel. Exactly. So, yeah, so for uh, batteries, uh, basically they need to, uh, their temperature need to be maintained at a, a really narrow temperature range near the room temperature. So if too hot or too cold, batteries can run into uh, performance degradation and safety issues. And we actually use refrigeration system to kind of cool those batteries. And, you know, if uh, we can control bubbles, control these phase stream process better, we could be able to uh, have a more efficient thermal management system. Thank you, Yang Ying. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, wonderful. So my next question is going back to you watching. Uh, love to see your comments in the chat. The question is, how high above Earth does the ISS orbit? So the options are A, 100 miles, B, 374 miles, C, 248 miles, or D, 698 miles. So what do you guys think? A, B, C, or D? How high above the Earth does the ISS orbit? While you guys are selecting your answer, let's bring in Jing Fan from the City College of New York. This research is an interesting one that I'm curious to hear more about, foams and emulsions. So I think we under, need to understand a term before we really get into it, and that are, what are colloids? Uh, colloids are particles or large molecules that are small enough to have Brownian motion, which is an uncontrolled movement, random uncontrolled movement. 
but also they are large enough to be characterized by optical microscopy through light reflection, absorption, or scattering. So sometimes people also use colloids to re represent mixtures of such particles or molecules with another substance. I mentioned they are uh, have that uh, properties. And so that determines that their size is on the order of one nanometer to one micron. That's the size of colloid, colloidal particles or substance. So one of the questions I had for some of the other researchers, and I'm kind of curious with, with every different project that goes up there, how is your experiment actually going to work when it's up at the space station? And what exactly are you testing? Yeah, our project uh, consists of two parts. The first part aims to understand the packing structure of uh, monodispersed emotions and forms at uh, cl close to the dry limit with zero fraction of the continuous phase. So in collaboration with our implementation partner, uh, a team at Lidos, we designed microfluidics system um, to fabricate uniform sized droplets and bubbles on the ISS. And the droplets and bubbles are collected in 3D printed wire frames to minimize the biasing effects from the boundary. Then the drawing process of the emotional foam is recorded by time-lapse Z-stack imaging. So for the emotion samples, because we used a, a pre-polymer solution for the droplets. So after the droplets are, uh, are, are compressed, I mentioned that uh, we, we studied the system at close to the dry limit. So after we have the uh, droplets or bubbles, we remove the continuous phase. So then the bubbles and droplets cannot remain their spherical shapes anymore. They have to deform and be compressed. So then for the emulsion samples, we polymerize the deformed particles to the deformed droplets to form hydrogel, non-spherical shaped hydrogel particles, which will be sent back to the earth for further analysis together with the imaging data. But this is the first part. And the second part of the project um, tries to understand, try to investigate how colloids, par colloidal particles influence their, how the shape and surface roughness of colloidal particles influence their ability in stabilizing forms and emotions. So we design a different types of uh, microfluidic system that allows us to uh, fabricate the droplets and uh, Bub or drop, uh, bubbles or droplets on the chip and then immediately collect them in the chamber for microscopy characterization. So we we'll look at the impacts of uh, um, particles, uh, particle concentration, uh, particle hydrophobicity, the surface property, and um, shape of the particles and surface roughness, how these factors impact the coarsening process of the forms and emotions. So with that, what are you hoping to learn or, or what is the end goal of the research? Yeah, um, so for the first part of our project, uh, as I mentioned, we study the packing structure of uh, compressed, monodispersed compressed emotions and forms. Um, so it um, comes from a long-term mathematics problem since 1894 when Lord Kelvin asked the question, how to partition a space into equal volumes with the minimum surface area? So this problem, uh, it's uh, impossible to find a solution mathematically by rigorous analysis. But because forms and emotions, these systems are dominated by their, the energy of uh, forms and emotions are dominated by the surface area. The lower the surface area, the lower the energy. So these systems would naturally exhibit a structure with the minimum surface area. So if we have uniform sized droplets and bubbles in these systems, we can imagine that their structure should be the solution of the Kelvin problem to 
partition a space into equal volumes with the minimum surface area. And the micro environment, the microgravity environment allows the droplets and bubbles to assemble, to freely assemble without the constraining effect from the boundaries. That's what also what we plan to do. We will collect them, collect the bubbles and droplets in some wireframes to minimizing the biasing effects from the boundary. So we expect our experiment to uh, at least give us some insights about what is the structure, what is the optimal structure of forms and emotions. And therefore, hopefully we can um, answer this long-term and solve the problem. And the second part, um, basically the second part of the project, we, we hope to understand how the impact of particle shape and surface roughness um, would influence their ability to, to stabilize forms and emotions. And this is important because forms and emotions find widespread use in many applications. Um, like in our daily life, we have uh, some many consumer products like from cosmetics or uh, foods, uh, cleansers and surface cleaners, they are forms and emotions. And also fluid dispersions are central to many technologies um, like for the extraction in the chemical industry, for oil recovery and the pollution remediation. So in this applications, colloids have emerged as an alternative stabilizing agents to replace traditional surfactants because of their demonstrated effectiveness in stabilizing forms and emotions, and also because of their potential to be fabricated by using more eco-friendly materials. So um, we think our study would uh, help us Better understanding, better understand these uh, widely used systems. Okay, that's actually more far-reaching than I initially thought. I never thought of all those products that we use on a daily basis as foams and emulsions, but obviously finding a more eco-friendly processes that can do the same job is is really important. Um, so, what is the what is the most exciting part of this project for you? Um. I think we have this opportunity to look into the problems uh, in an ideal condition, really. Um, the free of gravity and sedimentation on the ISS is an ideal environment for our study uh, because it helps eliminate some biasing effects or competing effects that uh, are n not necessary that, uh, for, for our study. So, uh, and also our the, the the results from our projects can potentially help improve um, the products that have wide 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 widespread use in our daily lives. Uh, so this makes me and our whole team really excited. Thank you very much for your time and good luck with your experiment. Okay, so for those in the chat that are curious about the question that I posed earlier about how high the ISS orbits above Earth. The answer is C, 248 miles above the Earth. So while it's much farther than I would ever want to run, you're talking about basically a tank of gas away. Uh, so that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, now I want to be able to bring in Dr. Ranga Narayanan and third year PhD student Jason Livesay from the University of Florida. Uh, their research project deals with Faraday instability, which I think I understand, um, but actually I'm hoping you guys can refresh me. Yeah, a Faraday instability uh, is really a, uh, a manifestation of surface waves, waves on the surface of a liquid. When a liquid, which say in contact with either another liquid or a in contact with a gas above it is shaken uh, in a direction which is perpendicular to the interface, to the common interface. So if you've got a glass of water, uh, you would shake it up and down. 
for example. And when you shake it up and down uh, at a frequency, uh, at a certain frequency, which is uh, close to the what we call the system's characteristic frequency, then patterns will begin to develop on the surface. And, or equivalently, you could shake it at a frequency, but keep, increase, uh, keep increasing the amplitude of that shaking, and patterns will begin to develop on the surface. These, the onset of those patterns is referred to as the onset of a Faraday instability. And it got the name Faraday because Faraday observed that when he had a, uh, a, gray, a, a bed of sand uh, or a bed of grain, uh, and when he struck a violin bow, uh, the sound waves would cause patterns on the bed of grain. And he was intrigued by this. So one afternoon, he went to the Royal Society and began to explain what he thought he was seeing. And the name stuck. It became the Faraday instability. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, so with that, how do flow patterns come into play, or, or I guess, why are they important? For several reasons. Um, uh, in the simplest case, uh, these patterns are correlated to the fluid motion, uh, which actually uh, caused these patterns, and uh, the intensity of that motion. Uh, and as a result of understanding the patterns, we can also understand the intensity of the motion uh, that causes those patterns, which in turn will affect a lot of applications. Uh, other reasons for understanding the patterns are that we can use uh, the knowledge of these patterns to uh, design or make films, thin films. Um, so while a film is growing, if you shake it uh, judiciously uh, with a certain frequency, uh, the uh, film that's growing will form patterns. And those patterns uh, are patterns that you can organize once you understand uh, what frequency is needed or what container geometry is needed to create those patterns. And those patterns uh, will ultimately uh, be of use for techno uh, for technological reasons. Okay. So when we talk about your project going up to the International Space Station, how is the, how is the actual project gonna play out? Uh, Jason and his, uh, and the team of students have uh, designed um, uh, a very complicated experiment Simple in thought, but complicated to execute. So we have one pair of fluids in two containers and another pair of fluids in two other containers. And two out of the four containers have different geometries. So what we do is uh, we have to remotely adjust the frequency of shaking of these containers and remotely adjust the amplitude of the shaking of these containers. When you go to low gravity or microgravity, during the shaking process, as we keep in incrementally increasing the amplitude for an input frequency, we expect to see patterns developing at the interface between the two fluids. We will then correlate these patterns to our predicted theories. In the course of creating these patterns, it's we expect or we should we should uh, anticipate that the fluids could mix, by which I mean not become homogeneous, but one fluid might start to go into the phase of another fluid. Or on Earth, these fluids would separate because of density uh, differences and because of gravity. But in microgravity, we don't have obviously uh, uh, a, a, a gravitational effect that will help the separation of the fluids. So the team has developed and designed what's called a demixer, which is part of this experiment. And after each experimental run, the fluid container will be put into centrifugal motion, which will cause a separation of the two fluid phases. And then we can continue with that container 
to the next experimental run. So it's pretty complicated uh, to run this and it, because principally it has to be put all together in a very small apparatus, roughly five inch cube, five inch by five inch by five inch and all done remotely. And then from that, what type of information are you hoping to, I guess, confirm or learn? Plenty. Uh, we, we've made predictions. Of course, there's no way of uh, validating those predictions. And the predictions we've made are this. We, we've predicted that the uh, interfacial patterns that we'll see in microgravity will be much smaller in wavelength effectively making those patterns quite choppy, as opposed to the same sort of experiment run on Earth. And the reason we say that we, we, we've made those predictions are that in the absence of gravity, we have another force. This other force is present also on Earth, but it's subliminal compared to gravity. Gravity is so overwhelming that the second force is the force of interfacial tension. Interfacial tension is also another force that appears in these fluid systems. It's just much smaller compared to gravity on ground, but in microgravity, it is the dominant force. And surface tension or interfacial tension, we use the terms uh, interchangeably, will cause the patterns to become smaller in lateral size or wavelength that makes the patterns look more choppy. That also means that we will see maybe uh, more intense motion near the surface. And that is something that we expect to learn from our microgravity experiments. And then how would these findings translate into real world applications? One, one way to translate uh, this work where we're actually physically shaking these containers, uh, mechanically shaking them, is by translating this to other ways of imposing accelerations. Uh, our group is working on other ways, such as using other forces rather than uh, mechanical forces. Other forces are electrostatic forces. You can use um, uh, AC, uh, uh, AC voltages, um, electrostatic voltages, also to create fluid shaking at interfaces. You could use magnetic forces. You could use acoustic forces in the same way Faraday did, uh, going back to Faraday. Uh, so we, we can translate this to other force effects. But ultimately, we, being engineers, are also looking for applications. And one of the major applications of this work will be in uh, being able to enhance heat transfer or the removal of heat in uh, from um, computing equipment, high speed computers, which produce a lot of heat. This will be true for aerospace technologies where, you, where we'll see sensors and computers on board aircraft, also in space. Uh, in microgravity itself, uh, uh, in a lot of places where the fluid systems are extremely small in dimension. So the key thing to understand here is when a dimension is large, you can have a lot of buoyancy when you're on ground or even when you're in an aircraft. But when the dimensions are very small of the order of microns, uh, the effect of buoyancy is very, very small, even if you are on Earth. Therefore, what we learn from our microgravity experiments while they're being done in space will have a lot of applications, even for Earth, for Earth benefit, where we can, where we are going to be concerned about thermal management of high-speed machines. For us to be able to run it from ground while it's on the ass, it's just very cool. So I think it's like the most exciting part is like our team not only gets to run this experiment, but it's like it's on the ISS. It's something that's in space. And so I know I'm pretty excited about that. I think our team is too. But yeah, it's also cool because it's like not only are we working with the team in Florida 
but we're also we're working internationally. So we, we have a collaborator in the Netherlands. So we've gotten to go over there and work with them and they helped us, you know, integrate our experiment and the Netherlands helped us build it and do the final integration. So I think those have been the most exciting parts for me. I don't know. Ranga, do you have anything to add? Absolutely, nothing more, except to say that uh, it's been exciting from uh, day one and we think the excitement is yet to come when we see the experiment run on the ISS. We've received, uh, we are extremely uh, grateful to the to the National Science Foundation uh, for funding this. Uh, we realize that we uh, have to be NASA compliant, which is why Jason is wearing a NASA T-shirt. And we've been able to work with uh, an implementation partner, uh, a NASA, uh, as well as the uh, uh, the National Science Foundation requires that we have an implementation partner that actually does the integration and have safety compliance. And they've been wonderful to work with. Um, so it's been excitement and we expect to see more positive excitement as well as we go forward. Okay, Jason. So if they told you that you had to hop on the rocket and go up to the ISS to run your experiment by hand, would you go? Would you do it? Yeah, no question. <laughs> I think that right. would be an awesome experience. <laughs> Thank you both for joining me today. We really appreciate your time. And just a reminder for everyone watching, we will have all kinds of content related to the research projects going up to the ISS, releasing all this week, uh, both the ones that we talked about today and some of the ones that we didn't cover on today's stream. Uh, and if you haven't checked out NSF's Discovery Filed podcast, I highly recommend it. We talk about new research, just like we did today, and we also talk to the researchers in the field and in the lab actually doing that research. Uh, so check it out. It's available on Apple, it's on Amazon, Spotify, or wherever else you get podcasts. And I'll put that link in the description. Um, that will do it for our stream today. Uh, check the description for links or take a tour of our YouTube channel and see any of the other content we have coming out. Not only just specific to the ISS stuff, but we're putting out loads of content every week on brand new science and engineering research. Thank you. The first stage is performing nom nominally so far.